Well, first, I want to dedicate the shir to uh, Rini uh, Molko, uh, Regina Basiosef Ruven, and Hani Shomer should have an aliyah on the schos of the shir. In any case, <clears throat> tonight is a Teves, literally. I mean, the fast doesn't begin until tomorrow morning, but uh, tonight is a Teves. So I thought it was important uh, to talk a little about a Teves. You know, what exactly is it that is so severe with the 10th day of Teves? Now, we know also... You can ask me, well, what do you mean by it's severe? Because Asur B'tavis is the only day, fast day actually, that if it fell on Friday, you would have to fast. Normally, uh, fast days don't fall on Friday. But if this one did, you would have to fast because it's very, very severe. So what I want to deal with is why is Asur B'tavis so severe? In other words, what is the sort of the hidden story of Asur B'teves. You see, <clears throat> now we know what the historical event is. We know that uh, this was the time that they surrounded the uh, Beis HaMikdash, the Vuchadnetza, and so on. And that was the beginning of the siege, which obviously culminated ultimately in Tishabov, which is the destruction of the temple itself. But like all things, the beginnings are always the most terrible time because that's when the Xera is. That's when you have the decree and so on, you know. In fact, you can almost say that Asar Bateves, because of that decree, is the real decree of the destruction of the Beis Amikdash. Yes, it was actualized on Tisha B'av, which is true. But once the siege began, then while that was the real decree, uh, except it took time until the Beis Amigdis was destroyed. So the question that I would like to deal with is what about it? It's so severe, you see. And the idea to that really in many ways is very fascinating. Uh, <clears throat> And, and, and that in itself involves a tremendous tragedy, as we will see. And I believe that's why it is so severe, you see. In any case, to begin, <clears throat> we know that the world needs what's called a tikkun. And a tikkun means, of course, some type of repair or rectification. And really that's what the God did. He created Olim Hazer, which is a world which is devoid of the revelation of his presence. So therefore, we don't realize that the real dimension or the inner dimension of this world is really spiritual, of course. That there's an entire spiritual dimension and underneath that, or I should say behind that, is God or the Rebbe Shlolem himself. You see. So therefore what the Rebbe wants is a tikkun. A tikkun means to restore the presence of God, that it should be apparent in this world. That's really what the whole purpose of creation is. And of course, the presence of God, when it, was re- when it will be revealed, will be the tikkun will be the actual repair, you see, or the rectification of the world. And of course, we, call, of course, we know what that means. That tikkun, the concept of that tikkun, is really the messianic era. That is what the tikkun really is. Now, we also know that, therefore, there's a tikkun process, you see. And the tikkun process we know, consists basically of three things. It consists of doing the will of God, basically, which is to observe the Torah, and therefore the will of God is to do mitzvahs, which of course are commandments. If commandments are not done, and they are violated, 
And of course we know there's tshuva. There is what's called repentance. And if that doesn't happen, then ultimately there is yesurin or suffering. And that's a third aspect. <clears throat> or I should say, it is a third tikkun device. And with all three, the world can have its rectification. Now we know these ideas. They're very basic. Okay. Now, what God did is he assigned specific nations that they are responsible for the tikkun in terms of yisurin or suffering. And the Jewish people, as we will see, which we know, is the agent of tikkun. They are the nation that has chosen to do this. And if they sin, <clears throat> then there are eight persecutory agents, nations, that are assigned uh, the task of uh, allowing, or rather allowing these nations to persecute or s make suffer the Jewish people. Who are these eight, eight nations? Well, the first one was Egypt, you see. Second is Bovel, Babylon. And then you have Persia. And then you have Greece. And then you have Rome. Those are the four nations that can persecute the Jews after Egypt. Then the last three, so that's five. The last three are Ishmael, who are basically the Muslims, you see. And uh, also... You have uh, one uh, Amalek. That's uh, they're probably the worst. And then you have the Arab Rav, which are really Jews that want to degrade or diminish the entire spiritual level of the Jewish people by claiming basically that the uniqueness of the Jews <clears throat> is not Torah. The uniqueness of the Jews is culture. And they are like any other nations. That's really what the Ear of Rav is. Not that they want to get rid of Ju Judaism, but they see Judaism as a culture, not as a spiritual request or demand or journey. It's basically a culture, you see. And therefore we are like every nation. So there you have it. Those are the eight nations that persecute the Jews if that's what they need to complete the Tikkun. You see. Now, besides being an agent that punishes the Jews or makes them suffer, they also provide environments that when the Jews are in them, they provide what's called the Sionis, which is tests or specific types of environments that the Jews find themselves in that they have to overcome and not be influenced by them, but to maintain their devotion and loyalty to God, to spirituality, and not be led astray or be enticed by the environments of these nations. And that also is a very important part of the Tikkun. So if you take a look at the concept of um, Bovel, if we want to start there. So the environment of Bovel, which is very interesting actually, Bovel was a very spiritually conscious nation. Of course the spirituality, they were very deity conscious was paganistic and in that sense that's spiritual the problem with that spirituality is that it is polytheism or paganism they believe in many gods but there is a concept called spirituality you see because even a pagan could be spiritual in that sense 
He doesn't believe in one God. He believes in many gods. So the Jews find themselves in Bovel, uh, which is that type of civilization. And the, the next type of, of civilization, right, which is a persecutory agent, is Persia. And Persia was known for its tremendous involvement with pleasure. And we will find even in the Megillah that uh, Achatreus throws this suda for who knows how many months, and so on. They were very much involved in pleasure. And that's another uh, environment of Nisoyen that the Jews have to withstand. After that, we find Greece. And Greece as a civilization offers tremendous chokhmah, wisdom. But we know the concepts of Aristotle and Plato and Socrates and uh, then they have the beauty of their architecture, their literature, and so on. So Greece offers beauty and wisdom, chokhmah, uh, in which the Jews find themselves, you see. Then we have, after that, we have what's called Rome. And Rome really, in a certain sense, embraces all of these three. And Rome offers a tremendously advanced civilization. You know, they're the height. They're the greatest nation on earth for at least a thousand years more in case of the Byzantine. But these are, this is an advanced civilization. And to the Jews, it's very intoxicating because it displays the greatness of man and his ability to live together as a society. You know, just based on Roman law, Roman architecture, you know, and of course Rome was filled with the Chokhmah of Greece, the wisdom of Greece, and so on. So these are the environments that these nations offer. And the Jews have to withstand these types of enticements, and they have to do what? They have to do the mitzvahs in spite of the temptations of these civilizations, you see. In any case, but what's interesting when you see all of this, you see, is a certain idea which most people are not familiar with, and that is who contributes to the Tikkun. Now, if you think about it, who are the agents of Tikkun? You see, who are they? Well, I'm going to mention that really. There are several, not just the Jews, which is interesting, because when the Jews fall short of doing the tikkun, then what God does is he can actually assign different segments of mankind to do the tikkun. Although the Jews obviously have the essential tikkun process, but there are other nations that assist as we will see. Now, the first one assigned to do the tikkun, which is to do the will of God in spite of the environmental temptations, is Odom Harishan, the first man, you see. And what he tries to do, right, is to do the tikkun. This is what Odom tries to do. He fails. So Adam is really the first one that attempts to do the Tikkun, you see. So that's number one. Then besides Adam, after that, because Adam failed, you have mankind. So they are the agents of Tikkun, the rest of mankind. <clears throat> and that goes on for 2,000 years, from Adam all the way till the, the Noach, and they failed so bad that God wiped them out, the marble, the flood. And then after them, you have another uh, ten generations, which of course leads to Avram Avinu. So mankind is the second, second segment of mankind. You see, the mankind is a, is a second segment that is charged with doing the Tikkun. But they failed. The third 
individual or agent of Tikkun, if you want to use that, you can call him. Of course, it's Avram Avinu. And he does the Tikkun at the level of an Av or patriarch. And of course, he is very successful. But Avram Avinu is not the one who is supposed to do the Tikkun. Really, it's his descendants, the nation, you see, the Jews. They are supposed to do the Tikkun. And they go to Egypt, or his descendants, the tribes, Yaakov and the tribes, go to Egypt. And there, they, they, the nation of the Jews are formed. In other words, the Jews become a nation, you see. And therefore, they are now born or developed after Egypt into a nation. And they enter Israel, and now the Jews as a nation, as a kingdom, they attempt to do the Tikkun. And therefore you have, of course, the nation of Israel, as well as Yehuda, because they, they got split. So therefore the nations of the world, right, the Tikkun segment is now the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of the Jewish people. They are the ones that have to do the Tikkun. But when you think about it, what happens? You see, they fail. Not totally, but especially the kingdom of, Yehu, of, of Israel, they worship idols terribly. Many of the kings of Israel not only were, uh, were idol worshippers, but they, they uh, corrupted their own people like Panasha uh, to worship idols, many of the kings, to such an extent where God said enough is enough, and he allowed Nebuchadnezzar, you see, to destroy the temple, which in a certain sense started the exile. Because until then, the Jews were a nation in their own land as a kingdom. Uh, so if you think about it, the concept that the Jews now become uh, sort of like defunct as a nation, you see, happens by the Horben Bayes region. And the Jews now enter, you see, the persecutory agent called Babylon. They left Egypt about 800 years before. And they now enter the second <clears throat> persecutory agent, which of course is Babylon. And that is the beginning of the first, what's called the first Shibud, the first empire that would subjugate them. So here we now begin to encounter a change in Jewish history where you have a subjugation to an empire called Babylon. And this, of course, if you think about it, begins. What does it mean it begins? It begins the, like I said, the subjugation toward the nations of the world. It's the entry in terms of what's called a clipper where the Jews now, in a certain sense, lose their independence and they become subject to the dominion, the domination of another nation. So we now begin to encounter the four nations. Who are they? Like I said, there's Babylon, Babel, there's uh, Persia, Poros, then there's Greece, Yavon, and there's Rome, Rome, which is, of course, Asav or Edom. So this is beginning where the Jews have basically lost their national statehood in that sense, and they become subjugated by these four nations. And they now are exposed to the different value system, the culture of these nations, and they have to withstand the temptations, and in that way they do the tikkun. But what is interesting also is this concept of tikkun <clears throat> in a certain sense, is now exhibited also by the nations. Because if you will see, as we will see actually, is 
the nations themselves have contributions to the Tikkun process, which we'll see. Now, if you take a look at the actual Tikkun itself, or the ideas or the concepts of the Tikkun, first the nations, or rather other Mauritian, and the beginning of mankind, is monotheistic, which means they believe in one God. The concept of polytheism or paganism, which is many deities, has not entered yet to mankind. Eventually, however, it does, you see. And the Rambam has an entire reason why, how it originated. In other words, if Adam himself believed in one God, so that, how do the people believe in many gods? Which is, of course, polytheism or paganism. And the idea the Rambam says, which is very interesting, is that the nations of the world, or the people of the world, became confused. In other words, they worshipped God, they realized there was one God, but they also thought that God has many emissaries, you know, uh, deputies, so to speak, that do His will. Eventually, these deputies themselves, which were very powerful, became all-powerful because they confused them to be gods since they were the emissaries of the one God. So eventually they began worshipping the emissaries, whether it be planets, the stars, or whatever else they made up, that they believed these emissaries, deputies, to be tremendously powerful figures. So what they did is they began to worship them. As time went on, these emissaries, or forces, whatever, were confused to be gods. That is the origin of paganism, which is interesting, which is what the Rambam says. So the world went from being uh, monotheistic, from Adam, in the time of you know, Adam Rishon, and became polytheistic because of this mistake or error in thinking. You see, then what happened, as we will see, as time went on, the world changed. And therefore, with the entry of Rome, when it became Christian, so they began to believe in what's called relative monotheism. Means, of course, there's one God, but really he's divided into three. Okay? So it, that's sort of monotheism, because it's not a whole... Uh, you know, uh, cavalcade of gods, you see. Uh, but they divided God basically into three forces or three powers. So that's relative monotheism, which is an important improvement on paganism. Then, of course, you came, came Islam, which basically really believes in one God. So Islam is really monotheistic. But what Islam did is it didn't corrupt the God, God himself, and make him into more than one, but it did corrupt the prophecy because it established Muhammad as the greatest and last of all prophets, greater than Moshe Rabbeinu, and so on. So what we do see is that the world slowly, slowly uh, improves in that sense, you know, from many gods to one God, or relatively one God, you see. Uh, now what's interesting, therefore, is we begin to see that Rome, which is really Edom or Esau, under Christianity, what they begin to do is spread the idea that there's basically one God and that there's an end to the world. It just doesn't continue. But there is an end to the world, you see. And this is the concept of a Messiah. Before that, people don't believe in a Messiah. They believe that the world will continue until whatever. But Christianity introduced the concept of a messianic age, even if it was in control of th uh, sort of three forces. So uh, that is an improvement 
Now the Rambam says, and this is where we begin to see the concept, the Rambam says <clears throat> that one of the purposes of Christianity is that they spread the concepts, they spread many concepts of Judaism. First of all, they spread the concept of the Bible, the Torah. They call it, of course, the Old Testament. But they made the Bible, the, the Torah, well known throughout the entire world. Like this was only, it was a, a safer that basically only the Jews had, you see. <clears throat> but what they did is they spread the, the, the Torah itself throughout the entire world because they adapted a tremendous missionary campaign. And they went all over the world, you see. In that sense, the Rambam says, which is very interesting, is that they were chosen by God to bring this concept to mankind. What about the Jews? No. The Jews should have done that. But because of the sins of the Jews, the Jews were now fundamentally involved in the level of Tikkun at a much more basic level, and that is that they themselves have to withstand the temptations of the nations and just, you know, sort of like guard themselves against, you know, assimilating into marriage, which unfortunately is happening today. So the Jews aspect of Tikkun, which is the essential aspect, is to do the mitzvahs of God and to withstand, like I said, the temptations of the nations of the world and to do the, the will of God. And therefore they do that by entering, as I said, these nations to do that, you see. And unfortunately, if they don't, then God reminds them to be faithful by having these nations persecute them. And that's really the function of the exile. It's what the exile does, you know. It puts the Jews in this light where they suffer, you see, if they are sinning. And at the same time, they're also trying to maintain their Judaism. That's what they do. But the ones who spread it throughout the world, the ones who spread Judaism throughout the entire planet, in that sense, is really Christianity. Uh, so what we see is something which is very important. And what is that? Is that uh, the nations of the world, in a certain sense, actually contribute to the Tikkun itself by introducing ideas which are much more serious in terms of truth than previously. And that, in a certain sense, is what started, you see, by Sorbetavis. Because the entry into what's called a klipa, the entry into Babylon, to begin the process of being subjugated by a nation, is a Sorbetavis. Because the siege by Babylon to destroy the temple started then, you see. And that is the beginning of the destruction of the temple. <clears throat> and of course, that is the beginning of the entry of the Jewish people into the exile itself. And like I say, in a certain sense, you know, uh, it's also the entry into nations that will persecute them if they so deserve. What is interesting is that even in Greece, there is a very important concept that Greece contributed to the Tikkun. And that is by providing the world with chokhmah, wisdom, logic, philosophy. And even though there are parts, obviously, of it which are anti-Torah, no question about that, but the basis of a lot of this stuff, the, the science, you know, the philosophical inquiries, logic, and so on, these studies, they introduce a person to truth, even if the results of those truths, in certain ways, right, are wrong. You know, the way they come to realize things which are not true. 
so the the fact that Greece, you know, um, surrounds the world with chokhmah itself is a very important advance toward the messianic process. Now, especially as I mentioned, Rome, in terms of Christianity, <clears throat> and that, by the way, is why Christianity grew. I mean, if you think about it, their founder, right? He was killed, he was crucified as a criminal. What are the odds that this individual was crucified, right, as a criminal, having violated Roman law, you see, because he declared himself Messiah or King of the Jews or whatever? What are the odds that this person will be the founder of a religion that has two billion people. In fact, Christianity, in many ways, is one of the most significant uh, moves in religion in world history. You see, what are the odds? There are no odds. The reason why the Rebbein allowed Christianity to grow beyond natural means, in fact, Rome became Christian, right? only basically 300 years after their founder died, which itself is incredible, because the Christians were persecuted at the beginning. Yet the whole Roman Empire became Christian, you see, on the Constantine, basically in 325 CE. And now what was that? That was like 280 years after the guy died. Itself was a... But the reason for that is the Jews now became occupied in terms of the, uh, the uh, Tikkun in their own way, which I mentioned. Yet the, what the Rebbe wanted is that somebody has to take on the mission to spread the concept of the Torah throughout the entire world, which of course is the spread of monotheism. So the concept or the, the task of Tikkun in a certain sense, some aspect of Tikkun, was actually given over to the Goyim. I mean, this is what the Rambam says. You see, now that is really in many ways very sad because it means that this job of influencing the world is now given over toward another people, another religion. That's terrible. Now, one of the things that the Bansham allowed even though it's hard to realize, is that he had the Torah translated to Greece. Ptolemy got 70 sages to sit down and write the Torah and translate it into Greek. That's what he did. And this version of Greek Torah is called the Septuagint, which means the 70, you see. <clears throat> and that event is looked on in Judaism is a terrible event. Why? Because it allowed Goyim, non-Jews, the access to the Torah. So therefore, they could distort it, which is what they do, especially when you take a look at Christianity. They take the Torah and they completely distort it, and they find references to their founder all over the Torah, which is, of course, absurd. They could distort it. Not only that, they can claim it as their own. You see? So it's terrible that the Torah is now translated and it's open to all. And that then, of course, from Greek it became translated to English. You don't want the King James Version and many other versions uh, in terms of the history of the Bible translations. It was a terrible time. Well, the interesting thing about that, you see, now we know that Asurbatavis is the beginning of the Jewish entry into what's called the Klippa, in, in, in terms of the Shibud, you know, the Shibud means, right, the, uh, the, the exile of these nations. And that was the 10th day of Teves. But when you think about it, I think, if I remember correctly, the 9th of Teves is the day that the Torah was completed or finished in Greek. And of course, we know why the Rav Hashem did that. Because the only way the world could know the truth of the Torah is if they are able to read it and understand it, you see. So therefore, he
he had the Greeks, it's really a divine act, he had the Greeks translate it. So therefore, the Torah can now be seen and understood by mankind, and in that way, many of the concepts of Judaism are now revealed to the nations of the world. Because in the end of time, that's really what the Rav Hashem wants. He wants the world to reach the truth, you see. And in a certain sense, the world has been going in that direction. The only part of the world that really doesn't move in that direction is the Far East. You know, there's a tremendous Hinduism is a classic avoid Zora. And even Buddhism is that. I mean, that's the way it's practiced today. All kind of, you know, worship of Buddha and so on, you know. But the Western civilizations are in- tremendously knowledgeable about the Bible. In fact, the, the Torah, the Bible itself, right, is the most published book in the history of publishing. So that shows you the extent of, uh, of the pervasiveness of the Torah throughout the world. So in a certain sense, Asur B'tavis, when you think about it, is the beginning of all this. It's the beginning of the entry or the exile into Bavel. It's the beginning of the Jews being able to be persecuted by the Babylonians and the Greeks, Persians, Persians of course is Purim, Greece is Hanukkah, Bavel is the destruction of the temple, Rome of course, is the destruction of the temple itself, again, and the founding of Christianity, you see. So therefore, in many ways, Asur B'tavis for the Jews is a terrible day because it meant that the Jews no longer had complete access. You know, I could put it in this way, the Jews lost the exclusivity of Tikkun. Until then, they were the exclusive individuals nation that could only do the tikkun nobody else could but they lost that exclusivity of the tikkun process you see because they were no longer worthy and therefore it was given in many ways to the goyim and this many in, in, in many ideas is an incredibly important concept you see and that's really what has been happening, you see. <clears throat> so ultimately speaking, it will go back to the Jews, you see. I'd mentioned that there are many agents of the Tikkun. You know, Odom was first, then mankind, then the third one was Avram, fourth is the Jews, that ultimately became a nation on their own, right? That's the fourth. And then you have after that, you have uh, the nations of the world now take over a certain part of the Tikkun process. But in the Messianic era, which is interesting, in the Messianic era, it will go back to the Jews. And that's where the Jews now have, the, the Tikkun will have been complete, and then the Jews will now be the ones responsible to, to reveal and to broadcast the truth of the Torah. So ultimately, it does go back to the Jewish people, you see. But we now understand the concept of Asur B'teves, why it is so bad. Because like I say, the real exile, or the, 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 the uh, section of the Avoida, of the Tikkun of the Jews, really begins in terms of they're now being subjugated in the exile really begins with a Batavis, you see. And the second thing, it's for number one, number two, the second thing which it begins, right, is the fact that a Batavis is also the time, like I say, uh, like I just said, the exile begins, but it also is where the Tikkun process is now given over to the Goyim, the non-Jews, and we see how different nations contributed different aspects of the Tikkun, even though they don't look like it, but they do. Like I mentioned Greece, you know, the, the desire to understand things logically, you see, philosophically and so on, is an aspect of truth, even if the conclu- many of the conclusions are wrong. 
But th- th- this, this went away from superstition, you see, which was a hallmark of the ancient nations. So Greece introduced the modern era where now not only beauty of civilization and culture, but also science, which of course is the pursuit of truth. All of these contribute. And when the Christianity adapted the Torah, which is the, their Bible, they call it, of course, the Old Testament, because there's nothing old about the Torah. That's what they call it, you see. Then what happened was, is they adapted many of the ideas of Jews. This is what they did. And therefore that became one of the ways that uh, the Tikkun is processed. Uh, so that's what we begin to realize about Asura Beteves. Like I say, the Jews lost the exclusivity of Tikkun when Asura, at, at the beginning of Asura Beteves, you see. And this really, in many ways, is important. And each one has their own way. What is interesting is that even those, these four nations are, have, you know, do contribute to a certain extent in the Tikkun process, they still maintain a lot of the evil that they do. I mean, take a look at Rome. I mean, Rome is a Esav. Esav is a Rotseach. He's a tremendous Baltaiva, tremendous into pleasure. He's also a murderer. That's what Esav is known. He's a Rotseach, you see. And therefore, in many ways, Rome maintained that aspect. In fact, I, I, I feel that it's interesting that this whole concept of uh, pro-choice, which is infanticide, which is to kill little babies, you know, to to allow women to decide to exterminate their babies before they're born. It's part of the ritzich of Esav. It's part of the murder of Esav. Because how can a human being terminate a life? What's the difference if it's not born yet? And there are people saying, of course, that you could terminate the life, right, even after it's born whatever, within a day or whatever. I mean, this is legalized murder. But how could you have such a trait in a civilized society? And the problem is that this is really a trait of Esau, you see. It's a trait of Esau. And I, found that I find it astonishing today that one of the worst offenders of infanticide is uh, President Biden. He is a tremendous advocate to promote the death of infants before they're born. Anytime, whatever, anytime, any place, for any reason. In fact, when you think about it, he should have been excommunicated by the church. In fact, there was a whole bishop convention recently, right? And they took up that issue. They should have excommunicated Biden. Because even according to their religion... Right? Pro-choice is a mortal sin. It is against the teachings of Christianity, the teachings itself. Except here's the President of the United States that is one of the most ardent supporters of child infa- infant infanticide, which is incredible. But he, they didn't do it because he met with Pope Francis and Pope Francis didn't say a word. Well, actually, nobody knows what he said to him. But he told the bishops to lay off Biden, not to say, do anything. So therefore, they did not excommunicate Biden. Now, how do you do that? How does a pope allow somebody to commit a mortal sin in the religion of Christianity? And the answer is because that's what Esav is. Tzicha, you see. Because it's really shocking when you think about that. So even though Christianity, in a certain sense, does contribute to Tikkun by making known throughout the world, you see, the whole concept of the Torah and the Bible and the Messianic era, and in the end there will be a heaven, and they talk about a, Gehenna, a hell or a Gehenna. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff 
they talk about doing the will of God and in a certain sense being righteous, which they say, of course, giving charity, whatever. You know, this is all well and good, you know, and so on. So that in itself is fine, you see. But they still are prone to do the evil characteristics that they have. In any case, so this is really what a Sorbetavis is. It is the beginning of the exile, uh, which is the beginning of the Jewish entry into a nation, nations that will persecute them, <clears throat> that will subjugate them to tremendous suffering. And it also means the transfer of their exclu- exclusivity of Tikkun that they should have done, however it would have worked, and now it is given over to other nations, and especially to Christianity, as the Rambam himself says, you see, to spread the word of the Torah, <clears throat> that nations should see this. So in any case, that's why Asurbatevis is so important in the Jewish calendar, you see. And that's why even if it falls on a Friday, you really should fast, because of that reason. <clears throat> and so on. So that's the idea of tomorrow, which is a Sarbateves. And in that way, we now understand the real significance of a Sarbateves. Any questions? Yes. Yeah. So if a Sarbateves was the entry of the Klippa into this Klippa that we're in, yeah. Um, fasting, does it help us release us from it? Yes. Well, what the fasting really does, uh, it allows us to to tshuva on the sin. Because the reason why Babylon or Bovo was able to do that, as the Gemara says, because they committed the three sins, right, of uh, idolatry, uh, adultery, right, and murder. The three grievous sins it's called Yehoreg V'al Yavo, that you should allow yourself to be killed rather than violate. And they committed all three of them, you see. And those sins were so grievous that uh, the Jews have to do a kapara, you see. And in terms of the second temple, it's because of Lashon Hara, you see. <clears throat> so that's why we fast, in some way to try to undo those sins that destroyed the Beit HaMikdash, which is obviously what it did. That's the obvious reason why we fast on a Sarah B'tevot, but like I say, also because of this. I did mention last week, which I want to mention again, that the Shabbos of Hanukkah, something very unusual happened. Now we know, and why did a Sarah why did they surround the wall and so on, on the Tent of Teves? Because Tevis is the mazel of Esau. That's exactly when his mazel starts. You see, on Rosh Chodesh Tevis, until the middle of Shvat. That's his mazel. In fact, the second time of his mazel, when it, his fortune goes up, is Tammuz, Rosh Chodesh Tammuz, right? And also until half of Av. So therefore, the destruction or the beginning of the destruction... And all of this, the entry into the Klippa and so on, that's Asur B'tevis, right? And so on. And uh, you have, and that's why one of the reasons why Tubishvat is so great, because it ends his mazel. And then in Tammuz, you have Shiva Asur B'tammuz, the 17th, the 17th day of Tammuz, which Moshe Rabbeinu broke the Luchas, which I'll talk about then. But also Tisha B'av happened also. So those calamities to the national stature of the Jewish people happened in the muzzle of Esau. You see. Now, what I mentioned a week ago, and I want to repeat it because it's a tremendous sign of hope, is that on Teves, Shabbos, it was Shabbos, it was Shabbos Hanukkah, it was Shabbos Miketz, when Yosef is released from his prison, it was also Rosh Chodesh, but it was Rosh Chodesh Teves, which is interesting, which is the mazel of Esav, but it, 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 it stands opposed to all the other 
incredible ideas, Shabbos and so on. But what was so extraordinary, which I mentioned, was that there was a total solar eclipse in Antarctica on Rosh Chodesh Teves. In other words, on Shabbos itself, there was a total solar eclipse. Now the Gemara says that a total solar eclipse for Goyim, for the nations of the world, is a very bad sign. That's what it says. It's a very bad sign because they count by the sun and that represents them. The moon represents the Jews because it waxes and wanes just like the Jews. They wax and wane in terms of their muzzle, the appearance anyway of their muzzle. So therefore, the total solar eclipse is a very bad sign for the Goyim. And the month of Esav, which is the major time of their muzzle, was actually harmed by a total solar eclipse. Now that is very rare. I don't even know when the last time that happened. But whatever it was, to have a total solar eclipse on Rosh in the, in the in the very uh, month of Esav is a very good sign for the redemption itself. That's what my feeling is. So that is a very strong uh, plus or positive for the Jewish people. And that's exactly what happened. You see. In any case, that's why we do tshuva. Okay, so then I heard also another um, reason for uh, fasting on Asara B'Tevet is yes. that in, in the heavenly tribunal court in Shamaim on this day is when they decide if the Beit HaMikdash will be rebuilt in this coming year. Yes. Have, have that's you heard true. that? Yes, that's true. <clears throat> and therefore, since the Bezdin convenes on this day, Asura B'Tevis, and it's decided not to build it, that is akin or equal to its destruction. Because the Gzera, the decree against the rebuilding, is equivalent to its destruction. So, with that decree, if the Beis HaMikdash was standing, it would be destroyed. And if it was not standing, if it was being talked about to rebuild it, and all of a sudden the decree is not to rebuild it, then that is the equivalent of its destruction. So that is true also. So that's also why the Aserbatavis is very bad, because that's the decree itself was uh, issued on Aserbatavis. <clears throat> but like I say, it's as, if you can add them all up, that Aserbatavis, which is the muzzle of Asav, right? So you have that, the decree, right? You have also the Jews entering the exile at that point, right? You have the Jews entering the, the you know, being, uh, entering the suffering of the exile and also losing their exclusivity of certain Tikkun aspects which are now given over to the Goyim. So you put all that together in the mix and that's why Asar Batavis becomes a true uh, downer, if you want to use that expression for the Jewish people. That's right. But they say that every year the tribunal court uh, is in session on this yes, day. Yes, every year. So now that's why tomorrow... it says any, that's why it says in Yushalmi, Talmud Yushalmi, that every year that the base of Migdash is not built, it is as if it was destroyed. And that's what I'm saying. It's Gezerah not to be built is the equivalent of it being destroyed because if it was standing, it would be destroyed. Yes. So that means every year we witness another destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. Exactly. Every year the Beis HaMikdash has been destroyed. How many times? Since the year 70 long time ago. So is That's how many times Beis Amigas has been Rabbi, destroyed. What was that? Is there anything specifically we could do besides our fasting uh, tomorrow to, you know, try to... Yeah, I will tell paper? you. Yes. Take on the mitzvah of Shemir Saloshan. Because that's what destroys the Beis Amigas. 
That's the key sin. The key sin in the Jewish people is pirud, separation, no achtos, you see. And those three sins for which it says it was destroyed all intensify the uh, period, the separation of the Jews, you see, especially Lashon Hara. And that's why Lashon Hara by itself destroyed the second Beis Amigdash. So I would say one of the greatest things you could do for yourself in general, and certainly not Surah Batavis, to take on to learn two halachas every day of Shmirat HaLashon. That would be the, I think, the perfect remedy for the whole concept of Asura B'tavis. Yes. You see. So I wanted to um, go over one thing. When you were talking yeah. about how um, you, uh, that the, we, the people, the nations of the world, they were monotheistic, but eventually they became confused and they... Yes. Um, they use like deputies and uh, missionaries of uh, to to be like as if they were they started worshiping them and then it became into their god. Yes. So do you see? I see. I don't know if you see it. Also, I'm sure you do. But a correlation with today, um, people are confused and they're using the science, that the Fauci, uh, you, whatever else uh, you could fill in the blanks, whatever it is. Um, but as the only way to follow, and they, and they're they're missing the the whole link of Hashem in it. It's, well, there's it's no order. question that that goes. Yeah, there's no question that that goes on in, in uh, all, all, you know all the time. You know, I mean, what do we, people worship today? Right? Today, people worship themselves. Think about that. You know, they 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 don't worship. You know, the, the, you, if you read some of the statistics, it's terrible. You know, like I was reading some statistic that said 34% of Jews polled said that they don't care if their kids are Jewish. Do you ever hear anything like that? So then what are they into? The answer is they're into themselves. They have taken over God, you see. And therefore they want to do whatever they want to do. You know, Manhattan, I, I read also that, um, uh, is it Manhattan? I think New York State. The majority of people in New York State are not married. Because they, they don't want to sacrifice. And, you know, marriage is a commitment. Well, you have to spend a lot of money to raise children. Time and effort, energy, and so on. They don't want to do that. They want to enjoy life. You see? That's why these people have chosen to remain unmarried. But then who are they worshipping? The answer is themselves. They have given up deities. People don't worship, you know, gods anymore. I mean, the Catholic Church is dying. That's what's happening, you know. 90% of the Catholic churches in Europe are empty. The only ones who visit them are the tourists. Catholicism is dying. Why? Because people basically today don't believe in God. You see? Or even if they do, they're not interested in committing any type of, you know, uh, effort and energy and time and money to religion. They want to do what they want to do and that's it. And so on. So today we see an unbelievable drive just said, do what you want to do. Don't bother with anybody, you see. So that's the way I see it. That we are now in the religion of self, where people worship themselves, and they have cast God aside. That, I think, is the, the most uh, symbolic or essential mood of the entire world, really. Because religion is being discarded all over the planet. You know, not all, but a great deal of, certainly the West, is discarding uh, religion itself, you know. And even in the other religions, you know, in many ways, they are used as a vehicle to express whatever they want to express. 
you know, follow the morality of what should be followed. So I, I see that as taking over mankind. Now, a great deal of this, of course, is assisted by science and by Darwinism and evolution. You see, because if you believe that you come from monkeys, then why would you listen to anything? Who determines the values, you know, of mankind? Nobody. You do. So why bother, you see? <clears throat> so there's no question that evolution has contributed to the demise of religion on a grand scale, you see. And even most people, even if they're religious, they don't know much about their religion. You, see, you know, people don't ask about their religion. They don't analyze or inquire or investigate at all. They just follow what their parents said or did. And they just observe, if they observe at all, on an incredibly superficial level. So is that called being religious, really? There's no thought. You know, you just do what you want. Try to get away with what you want. So that's basically, you know, what I see is the major driving component of this time. But Rabbi, if, if the, this time right now is so dark and the veil is so thick in front of many people's eyes, especially the people that you're explaining, and, and they are Jews that are like that, many of them, uh, how are we getting out of it? I mean, we have to finish the tikkun. We ha how, uh, like, how do you come out of it enough where we're ready to, to, for the Mashiach to be here? You know what I mean? You said the Mashiach can't come until the nation is, is ready to, to receive him. So yes. If people well, the the are answer to that question, there, uh, there is no humanly way possible. What will happen is God will change the consciousness of the world, probably by an event which is absolutely staggering and cannot be denied. That's exactly what he did in Egypt. Jews can't leave Egypt. It's impossible, you know. But what he did, of course, is he wiped out Egypt. That moved them. You couldn't deny the Nile turning to blood or any of the other Makkas. Then all of a sudden, the Makkas Bechiris is unheard of. Every Bechor in Egypt dies. Who knows how many people that was? There's no such disease that can do that, you see. So that's what God needs to do, to change the consciousness of mankind. He needs to do an event which is so astonishing that everybody will realize the truth about what the Torah says. Once that happens, then everybody's going to want to seek the truth. They want to learn more about God. You see, and that's what will happen in the end of time. Like it says, you know, there will be, in the end of time, there will be a hunger not for bread and a thirst not for water, but to know the word of God. Really? We, want, we, we see the opposite happening. Nobody's thirsting to know God. On the contrary, who wants to know God? But the answer is, there has to be some type of supernatural event that's going to shock the world into a different consciousness just like it happened in Egypt there is no other way really you see and once that happens then there will be an incredible drive and quest to know the Emmas you see and what? therefore everybody who gives a sheer in Torah is going to be in the limelight because everybody's going to go on to know what does God have to say about existence and so on. Hopefully we're not far off from that. See, you're looking at it from natural means. This cannot be natural. It will never happen that way. It has to be an extraordinary supernatural event that's global. That's global. Because the Jews are no longer in one nation like Egypt. They're all over the world. We know that. Every country in the world is Jews. So it's got to be global. But we don't know how that's going to happen. But it will. And that's what it means that even if your exiles 
outcast, be at the ends of heaven, from there, Misham, Yikabetzcho, God will gather you. Which means that event will be so stupendous that, you know, everybody's going to want to find out about God. See, this, this is a supernatural event. Extraordinary. That's how it changes. In order for that to happen, uh, the Pegida needs to happen first? Uh, the the Pekida, yes, it has to happen first. As long as the Shechina, and as long as the Mashiach ben David and Mashiach ben Yosef are in what's called the Klippa, which means in prison, figuratively that is, it cannot happen. It can only happen after their release. And that's the first thing that will happen. You see. So the way we'll know that they're released is when this miraculous thing happens globally around the world. Yes, basically. That's right how now we, know. we don't know if they're released or not. So we're we just don't know. Waiting no. On this event. That's right. I'm hoping that this the solar eclipse is a sign that maybe this month it will happen. You Amen. know, but okay, that's my Amen. that's my feeling. Amen. But we don't know. One thing is sure, it will be extraordinary. We are not looking here at your average story that's going to be in the newspapers. The Messiah has arrived. You know, it'll be extraordinary. You see, just like Egypt was extraordinary. And that's what happened. It'll happen again. But this time when it happens, it's over. Then it's over. Remember what I said. God is going to re- he's going to press the restart button because the gula must restart uh, because mankind has reached <clears throat> the 49th level of Tum'ah. It's already happened. And we know God is going to press the restart button. That's what he always does. And this time the restart button is the Mashiach himself just like he did with Egypt. The problem is the Jews are not worthy of the redemption, so therefore God has to bring them up to speed, and he has to bring a kapara to the world itself. And that's happening. You know, that's why there's so much, uh, in many ways, uh, uh, suffering and so on. I have a question, Rabbi. Yeah. So, so until this big event, it just seems like we're we're really we we're craving this light, we're like looking for light, and we just had we just had Hanukkah and we had the um, the Or Haganun, and now we have the Asara B'Tevet. Is there? It just seems like we go from holiday to holiday, just hoping for a little bit of light. Like okay. we don't really. So is there? You know, and all these things happening this year, like it's a leap year, are all these things like a little bit of light for us? Well, you know, look, each holiday is has its own meaning, its own purpose, its own, you know, uh, function in the tikkun. It's really what it's all about. And ultimately, we will have succeeded. The tikkun hakloli, which is the total rectification of creation, will happen. And then it's over. <clears throat> I mentioned last week, by Yosef could not hold himself back. If you remember last week's shir, I believe that God will begin the process, the Gaula, before the end of the Tikkun. He won't be able to hold himself back, so to speak. Right? Just like Yosef couldn't. And that's the Rachim Gedolim. That's, for one second I will abandon you. And incredible mercy which is the kibbutz, I will gather you in, in tremendous mercy. That tremendous mercy is the fact that the tikkun has not been completed. Yet God says, enough is enough. I'm the boss, and I declare it's over, and it's over. That's what we're waiting for. When God finally has enough of the sinning, 
and the incredible rebellion of mankind against his will and against the Jewish people. You see, that's when it's going to happen. So I'm hoping it's going to happen very soon, that he's going to be fed up with the whole process. He wants to end it now.